Uh, speak. Yeah. Yeah, they're just getting in now. Okay. All right. Well, All right. Good I think everyone's in. Everyone's in. All right. Well, good afternoon. Um, well, welcome to uh, the first uh, chat with Green Aggies in September 2020. And uh, I'm Dr. Meng Mengu. I'm a professor extension specialist uh, in the horticulture department at Texas A&M AgriLife. By the way, this is my third day my only third day as a full professor <laughs> in, in the department. When I left a, uh, uh, well, thank you, a, a Facebook message. I said, you know, uh, that was on um, uh, August 31st. I said, this is my last day as an associate professor at Texas A&M. So many people thought I was leaving. No, I love my job. I love this place so much. No, that was just, uh, you know, in the academics, we have the ranks to uh, climb up. So I was, uh, an associate professor, and today's again my third day as a full professor. So we have a, a very nice uh, lineup, uh, and today uh, on our panel, we have, you know, of course, our uh, gorgeous uh, tech uh, specialist, uh, tech special, the tech host, Airphone Wi-Fi. We have uh, Laura Miller, we have um, uh, Carlos Bogron, our tech, our uh, industry re representative. Oh, Amanda is on. Um, so, uh, so what well, with that, uh, um, I'm going to let, let uh, uh, Laura to go first. Uh, Laura today is going to talk about two topics. The first one is poison ivy, um, poison ivy management, and the second one is uh, plant of the week, uh, Vitex. And then Amanda, well, Amanda is actually our uh, second presenter today, and uh, um, uh, she, she comes from uh, native Texas nurseries. Uh, I think, you know, fall, although we still, we may still have like triple digit um, temperatures outside, but it's fall, the fall is coming. So, um, so that's a little, um, you know, preview of our program today. Now, Laura, you ready? Yeah. Okay, poison ivy. Um, that photograph shows uh, Wendy Pappas, landscape manager for the city of Arlington in her Halloween costume for last year. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, nah, just, just, just kidding about that. I, we're going to talk about the actual plant. Um, so we're going to kind of just, you know, how do you recognize it? What looks like it? The, the great qualities of poison ivy, it is a native plant after all, and, you know, has some lovely ornamental uh, qualities. And, and then we're going to talk about the bad things about it and also just how you get rid of it. So, so poison ivy, heading on. Yeah. So where does poison ivy grow? Well, um, poison ivy is pretty good at kind of blending in in the understory of most woodlands here in Texas. Pretty much all over the state you can find poison ivy if you look for it. Uh, especially here in North Texas, we have a lot of it in any natural area that's a little shady. It's also great at living in North Texas landscape beds. And that was the question that I got this week was, you know, we, we're taking on a new property to manage and there's a lot of poison ivy and, you know, what's the best way to, to handle it? That's one of the things that the the owners of the property are, are most concerned about. So it's, it's, often there um, and if you know what you're looking for you're going to see it all the time so let's let's go on to the next one most of the time in in texas when we have a one of these plants you know sometimes people call it poison oak but really what we mostly have all over the state is actual poison ivy uh, there is poison oak in southeast Texas, and there is also poison sumac right along the Louisiana line in East Texas. But most of what we got is the actual poison ivy, Toxiodendrocon radicans. Um, it's a member of the Anacardaceae family, which is related to, interestingly enough, the tropical fruit mango. So if you're allergic to poison ivy, you might also be allergic to mango sap. And if anybody's had an experience where they, you know, had a strange reaction on a tropical vacation. That's very well what it could be. So onward to our next uh, slide. The, the little saying that we always uh, tell people to remember is leaves of three, leave it be. So on this tree, you can see two different beautiful native vines 
one of them has leaves of three, that's the one on the right, but the one on the left has leaves of five, and that's our Virginia creeper. So you got, you know, both of them growing in the same habitat very frequently. Um, in my front yard, I have a lot of Virginia creeper growing, but fortunately I'm able to, to keep the poison ivy out, but it would be equally happy in the shady yard at my house. So gotta look for those leaves of three. Now, the next thing that you may see are these white berries, and it's one of the few vining plants that produces a white berry. But you don't see these very often because they are not poisonous to birds, and birds usually eat them pretty quickly. So you don't see those white berries all that often, but it's, it's definitely a white berry vine. And in the winter, when it doesn't have leaves and probably doesn't have any berries, you can often recognize poison ivy by the, the stems. They produce tons of aerial roots, and so it'll look kind of like a really hairy, rooty kind of stem that, that doesn't look a lot like other, other plants. But they do have to get kind of, uh, kind of mature before they'll look like this in the winter. But you can recognize it in the winter, even without its leaves and its berries. So onward to the next one. Well, our first look-alike is obviously Virginia creeper. Um, they're often in the same environment, but Virginia creeper climbs with tendrils. I don't know if you can see in that picture, but the stems of Virginia creeper will not have all those aerial roots. Um, also, Virginia creeper pr produces a purple berry, a purple berry in the fall versus a white berry on poison ivy. But these are, they just love the same habitat, so they're often in the same places. Another lookalike is box elder, which is actually a maple. It's a member of the maple family, so it's got opposite, opposite leaves. It's got a compound leaf. This is one of the only compound leaf native maples. Um, but it, those leaves will be held in an opposite pattern versus poison ivy, which will be a, an alternate leaf. Uh, pattern. And also box elder will sometimes have leaves of five. It's not consistently leaves of three. And finally, if you see a box elder bug, like up there on the left, you know you are dealing with box elder, not poison ivy. That, that they pretty much go hand in hand. Here's another lookalike, fragrant sumac, which to me, the, the shape of the leaf does look kind of like poison ivy, but it's, and they are leaves of three. But the plant habit is different. It's not as much of a vine. It'll grow out in the sun. It has red berries, not white berries. And, and it has a sumac smell. Some say it has like a skunky smell. Its uh, name is aromatica and it's definitely aromatic in a way that poison ivy is just not. All right, so what's great about poison ivy? Well, it's, it's beautiful in the fall. I took this picture, uh, this is a post oak tree, looking up into it, I, there was so much color. I was like, wow, this is you know, a beautiful post oak tree. And then I, I looked at it a little closer and it was just a post oak tree with some beautiful poison ivy growing in it. Um, it's also good for wildlife, of course, because the birds eat the berries. Deer like to eat poison ivy, they can eat the leaves and it, don't have any problems with it. So it's a, it's, it's a native plant. It's, it's got some things going for it as far as wildlife value and it's also quite attractive. But um, I, you know, this is the bad part, the Eurishaw. And if you have um, about three or four minutes, we won't watch it right now, but I do recommend going to the CDC website. Um, they have a really cute little animated um, illustration of how Eurishaw which is an oily substance, binds to your skin, and how your body comes out with an allergic reaction and your Mr. T cells to attack it. But the important parts to remember here is that it is an oily substance, so you do need to really wash with soap and water to get rid of it. And the sooner you do that, the sooner your body can not react to it. <laughs> or the less likely your body is to react to it because it's not there very long. So it's really important whenever you're working out in an area where you, where you are encountering poison ivy is that when you get back, you know, you change clothes, take a shower, wash your clothes, wash your 
boots, which rubber boots are great for working in poison ivy. Wash your gloves, wash everything that you've had on because this oil will cling to everything that, that, you're, that you're exposing it to. So washable gloves. Um, if you're going to uh, pull poison ivy off of trees or out of a landscape bed, you don't want to compost that, obviously. You want to bag and dispose of the plants. You do need to clean your, your tools with soap and water or with alcohol. And you should never burn any poison ivy debris because the urushal can um, uh, aeros aerosolize, I guess, in the, in the smoke and you can breathe it and have an allergic reaction, which can be very dangerous. Um, uh, dangerous mm -hmm. as in you might not be able to breathe. Not related. Would poison ivy aerosol kill a COVID aerosol stuff? I, I don't know. <laughs> probably not. You'd probably just, you know, um, have a virus and a, an allergic reaction if you, you know, breathe COVID and poison ivy. <laughs> so you really have three different management options. One is the, the, the thing that works with every single plant. If you can mechanically remove it, if you can dig it up and remove it, um, you can get rid of it. Poison ivy has a root system. It can be a pretty big root system on a big vine, but it's not an extremely uh, uh, difficult root system to remove. It doesn't break off. It doesn't have storage uh, tubers or anything like that. It's, it's just a regular woody plant root system. Um, now, the second thing you can do is, you know, actively growing plants. Glyphosate herbicides work pretty well. Um, Right now, when this person contacted me this week, I'm kind of like, you know, before it rained, of course it rained yesterday, day before, so the plants may start actively growing again, and you could probably treat them with glyphosate, but it was really, really hot. Most plants were not growing much. That's not the best time to try to get a good kill with glyphosate. You could also use other contact herbicides, but of course those are not going to translocate and kill the roots, so you've got to keep going after it if you're, if you're using something like a, a vinegar or, um, you know, just one of those other contact herbicides that's not going to be systemic. But glyphosate will kill poison ivy. And then finally, the last, the last treatment is um, triclopyr, uh, like we use on a lot of brush. You do need to be careful using triclopyr around valuable trees and other woody plants. So the best way to do it is to cut the stem and treat the stump of the stem immediately with the triclopyr to kill the root. Um, the top of the stem obviously will be cut off from the root and will die. So those are kind of the three ways to get at it. And that's it. Isn't that pretty though? It's kind of attractive that new growth. So anybody have any questions about poison ivy, we'll be happy to try to answer them. Okay. Or uh, what about let's wait until the, the until end? Until the end? Uh, okay. Until the end. Yeah, right. so yeah, are you ready for uh, Vitex? Sure, I'm ready for Vitex. Uh, I chose this for the plant of the week this week because it is one of those things that does bloom when it's hot, which is what we're looking for around here. Uh, this is Vitex agnus castus. Uh, we sometimes call it the Texas lilac, and we do that not because it smells like a lilac, but just because we can't grow regular lilacs very well in most of Texas. It's just too hot. Don't get the chilling. Um, only place in Texas you can really grow a nice lilac is up in the panhandle. Um, down here, not such a good idea. So this is one of those things that's kind of in between a tree and a shrub, and it sort of depends upon how you manage it. Um, you can get a really pretty little tree out of it, like the, the one on the left that's, that's limbed up kind of nicely, and it makes a, a lovely, um, lovely small tr ornamental tree, much in the way you would use um, crepe myrtle or, or um, uh, another blooming tree in full sun. It'll, it'll do that same thing, but you can also manage it as a large growing shrub. And you can cut it back pretty severely and, and manage it as a smaller shrub. Um, up in uh, north of zone seven, uh, it's often cut back every year uh, the way we would do a Turk's cap and it'll come back out and it'll bloom by midsummer. So it's a pretty fast growing thing. 
Now this, if you follow the Texas superstars carefully, you'll know that this was one of the early superstars because it is a great tough plant that, that grows all over Texas and looks good. Um, but it was, it was taken out for several years and that was because of this next little issue. Uh, it can be invasive. Uh, it does seed out pretty easily. There are certain um, environments where it's more likely to be invasive, and uh, these are supposedly limestone, limestone outcrops through Central Texas. Mandy may have some more to say about this, uh, being more down from that kind of area. Even in your own landscape, you do often have problems with seedlings coming up because it 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 does it is generally even to the best of my knowledge most of the cultivars are fairly fertile from seed and definitely the, the species is. Um, it can be managed. Uh, they decided to put it back in the Texas Superstars uh, that the invasiveness was not such an issue in most parts of the state. However, it's something you always want to keep in mind. This is native to Asia and the Mediterranean, so it's not a, it's not a Texas native like our beautiful poison ivy. Um, does need to grow in full sun. It will flower uh, pretty well from about May until frost, though it does benefit from deadheading. That's one kind of cool thing about maintaining it as a shrub. If you keep it as a shrub, you can do that a little bit more easily and get more flowers. There are some lovely cultivars. Um, you get a little bit different color with these different cultivars. Uh, you get a nicer habit, so I would look for those. Uh, there may be more selected as we go along. It's not something that there are tons and tons and tons, not like a crepe myrtle, tons and tons and tons of cultivars. There are white forms though, so you can get, you know, from white to purple to blue, so you can get some color variation. Um, it is pretty easy to propagate. As, as I said, it comes up easily from seed. Um, you can also propagate it easily by cuttings, and sometimes people in their landscapes layer the lower limbs and, and get more vitex uh, that way. It does have really interesting foliage. Um, you can kind of see the foliage in these pictures, but it looks a bit like another plant, which I have heard of a, of a famous story of a nursery having a nice crop of vitex that was not in flower that, that someone decided was, was not vitex and, and they got a little inspection, but um, had no problems in the end because it was definitely by taste. So it's a great plant. It's really tough. One of those things that handles the heat really well and keeps going in the summer. And that's, that's what keeps us all happy these days. So, all right. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, this year I noticed uh, that because they, you know, this, we had, we had a really mild uh, winter. So, um, Vitex flowered earlier this year, you know, earlier than than normally they do this year, and right now, uh, right now, you know, we're seeing here in College Station, we're seeing the second flush. We're seeing the second flush on the plants, and while you could also see, you know, the the seeds, the mature seeds from the from the first flush of flowers. So um, it, it, they just really they could just uh, keep going if the temperatures, you know. Uh, suitable it's the temperature is good so yeah Absolutely. Uh, yeah our, our next speaker is mandy mandy do you want to show your uh, webcam uh and also do you want to uh just uh, share from your own computer i'll stop sharing on my end i have it um set up on By the way, uh, did, Mandy, do you have it set up or not set up? Oh, I do have it set up. Oh, so, go, go ahead, then. Go ahead, show your screen. Yeah, just, just share your screen. By the way, uh, in case you guys don't know, um, Ervon, again, our fabulous uh, tech host, Ervon, in addition to being a panelist, Ervon is... Uh, is uh, uh, streaming this on uh, Facebook Live, so so uh, yeah. To wave everyone, uh, yeah. Yes, wave everyone <laughs> and smile. <laughs> okay, well, great. Uh, you ready to go? Okay. Yes. All right. Can everyone hear me? I'm I'm using yes. my boss's computer, so. Um, 
All right. Yes, I'm here at the nursery right now. I'm using my lunch hour to uh, present to you guys. And the phone might ring and stop. So and thank you very much for no, the time. No, and we get this, we get this, you know, the background of your, uh, you know, the, your background give us a real life of a nursery. <laughs> exactly. It's in, we're in it. It's happening. Tractors and phones and everything. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, Meng Meng had asked me to kind of talk about fall planting in Texas specifically. So um, I work with native plants every day. And so I kind of see what does best in the fall and what doesn't so much. And I also keep track of what our retail sales are and what's popular at certain times of year, depending on the climate. So she thought I might be a little bit of an expert in this. So we'll see. A um, little short intro real quick. I do have a plant soil science degree from Texas Tech, Reckham. I am currently based in Austin, Texas, and I've been working here at the nursery for over four years. And so, you know, I went into horticulture not really knowing what I was gonna do. I actually have a minor in turf grass, but got this job right out of college and kind of found my passion um, was, is, is native plants and really spreading the knowledge of their benefits to, you know, our local fauna and endemic wildlife, but also shedding light um, on their extremely important contribution to water conservation, um, which is a growing concern in Texas. I know our aquifers are starting to run a little low, so we got to think smart if we want to keep our landscapes. Um, so we'll just dive right in. The general climate during a Texas fall. Um, usually around Labor Day, we finally get some relief. I know here in Austin, it was over 100 every single day, except for one or two days, I think. Um, and it was brutal. So we got some relief this week. And of course, it's like I said, right around Labor Day. We tend to find that we hit our peak and then we start, you know, it, it only gets better from here, hopefully, with some of those like little pop ups um, of last minute summer. Um, temperatures range from 50s to 90s. But you know, we, we, we might have hotter days, but we still will consistently have cooler nights and the days are drier. Um, and drier days in terms of humidity and the dew point is a lot lower, so it's much more comfortable. Um, but Texas is a big place. You know, we've got Big Bend and then we've got Houston. They're like two completely different worlds. So, you know, I when I made this presentation, I tried my best to like paint a large swath over all of Texas, but it's really hard to pin down what works great everywhere because we are such a large landmass and there's so many different climates. Um, so I kind of catered, I, I do apologize in advance if it doesn't apply to you, I catered to Central Texas, Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio area because um, it's what I'm most familiar with. Um, so as I was started making the presentation, I was thinking, oh, okay, I'll just kind of go through all the stuff that looks great in the fall. And then I got to thinking, well, it only looks good in the fall if you planted it in the spring. So that's kind of the honest truth about those fall showstoppers that um, some of you might be familiar with. If you want to wow your clients or yourself, I guess, if you're landscaping for yourself um, in the fall with a nice garden um, between September and December, you're going to really want to establish that stuff in the spring. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, but you know, one of the main reasons is once it's established, it's able to go through the hot Texas summer, it comes out of that, and then it usually just like wows in the fall. So um, I recommended a few here. This is, you know, not limited. There's dozens of different things you can plant. Um, I tend to stick with natives, of course. Um, so I recommended uh, Mexican bush sage. Um, this one is has large purple blooms that's super fuzzy. It's a great pollinator plant for hummingbird, bees, and all kinds of stuff. So one of my favorites. Uh, and the picture right there, that's our little demonstration garden here at the nursery. It's fall aster. That right there is one of my one of my favorites because it is one indicator of fall about to happen. So when you start seeing that bloom, you're like, oh, I can get out the pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> you know, it's about to be fall. So that's a really 
Um, copper cane daisy, it blooms pretty much all year, but I find that in the fall, it'll put on a huge second bloom. Um, so it, it is another nice one to have like consistent, um, you know, yellow and beauty in your garden in the, uh, throughout the year, but I can show. Uh, Mandy, skeleton. Mandy, Mandy, can you uh, stop your uh, video cam? That may help the audio to go uh, better. Oh, yeah, sure. Emma, uh, and I'm very sorry again at the nursery. We have terrible Wi Fi. Hold on. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> let me know if this um, uh, Mexican mint marigold, that is a wonderful earth. Plant, herbal plant that you can stick in your garden um, and it blooms in the fall, which is really nice. And it'll like a blue and yellow. It's one of my favorite. These are my favorites. I'm a little biased on all of these, but um, there's much more. And then, of course, your favorite, uh, your autumn sage. You really want to plant those in the spring because then in the fall, you're really going you're gonna to know why. They, they look great. And then one I wanted to mention on here, one that we started growing last year was forsythia sage. Um, I put this one on here because this is, it blooms in the fall. That's when it happens. But the only problem with this one um, is it's endemic to, you know, the high elevation regions of, tropical regions of Mexico. So I wouldn't recommend planting it anywhere north of Austin. Um, the reason being is it's uncanny every year when it sends out this massive yellow bloom spike, uh, we get a freeze the next day and then just the whole plant turns to bush. So it would do great in Houston um, or South Texas somewhere, but that's, I would recommend it for that area, but I would recommend it for um, really anywhere else. You get those random 80 degree days to 20 degree days. So what is the best to plant now? That's why we're here. So right now, you really just wanna focus on trees, your ornamental trees, your woody perennials and your shrubs, um, your seeding your wildflowers, as we all know, and um, the wildflower plugs and your hardy succulents. So I'll get started with your shade trees. Um, I don't think I'm really surprising anyone or introducing anyone to any new species here by going through these, but um, they're all, always good to get a refresher and a reminder of some neat natives that you can plant. Um, your live oak, of course, it's evergreen, but one thing to keep in mind is oak wilt. Is it in your area? If it is, don't plant it. Um, so, but it, there's plenty of other options, but if you don't have a really big problem with oak wilt, it, it's a wonderful addition. Uh, red oaks, they are deciduous and they do provide that beautiful fall color. Um, so obviously you plant it in the fall. I wouldn't expect it to wow you really until the next year. Um, and uh, there's different crosses and species. The one we grow here at the nursery is uh, an alkaline prone. So it's great for central Texas. Uh, it likes the caliche and the high pH soils. Um, but there's different ones. I think just the regular Texana is, um, is more acidic. From. So, so just know your area and your soil and plant the right one. Uh, Mexican white oak, or also known as Monterey oak, is a semi-evergreen depending on the time of year. And I put oak wilt resistant in quotations because I have had many conversations um, with, you know, tree growers that swear that this is false. Um, but what I like to kind of remind them is it's Quercus polymorpha. Um, I think Bill calls it Quercus promiscuosa. <laughs> it likes to cross easily. So if you're, if you're polymorphous crossing with other Quercus species, you might find that your quote unquote Monterey oak is suffering from oak wilt. But I do firmly believe that Quercus polymorpha true is, is oak wilt resistant. So keep that in mind. Um, and then my favorite oak, Texas native oak, is bur oak. Um, it's deciduous, it's fast growing, it's great for shade. We have a beautiful one out here in front of the office that from a 15 gallon, it is now 30 feet tall by 40 feet wide, and that's only been 15 years. Um, it's, ha it's obviously very happy, but it makes these huge leaves and the shade is just you know, 
unparalleled. It's amazing. And even when it does drop its leaves, the canopy is so complex that it still provides lots of shade. Um, not that we're looking for that really much in Texas winter, but in the summer, it's lovely. Um, other shade trees to consider. We don't just have oaks. We have Olmus uh, genus, uh, more specifically the cedar elm. Um, it's deciduous and it has beautiful fall color and spring color. Uh, when this thing is budding out in the spring over in a lot of our local parks, um, it's lime green. It's super pretty. So I reckon it's just year round interest unless it, you know, until it drops its leaves and it's fast growing. Um, of course, you have your bald or Montezuma cypress, depending on your location. Um, if you have an area where you want a bald cypress, but doesn't ever get any water, I would recommend a Montezuma cypress. It's going to be more drought tolerant and it apparently has no knees. Um, so bald cypress apparently have knees and, and they do. Um, and I've, I've heard there's species or there's so, you know, cultivars out there that, you know, growers have made that don't have them or they claim not to have them. But if it really bothers you, Montezuma uh, is your one. And they have attractive fall color as well. Um, of course, you have your native pecans. They are fruit bearing after a really long period of time. Don't expect to get pecans after you plant it a year after, but um, they're great for a water loving area and they're deciduous um, and they're beautiful. And the Mexican sycamore or even American sycamore uh, is really pretty. I prefer the Mexican because the back of the leaf is extremely silvery and glittery and when it goes in the wind, it's just it's beautiful. And then the leaves are huge, so it has a really nice um, calming sound to it when the wind blows through it. But that's another great one to plant as well. Um, moving on to ornamental trees. Um, I find in the spring when our retail sales uh, from our retail nurseries ramp up, the really popular uh, items that are ordered are Texas redbud, Mexican plum, anacotra orchid, mountain laurel and the re and all five gallons and the reason being is because people are driving around town and they're seeing these things blooming everywhere and they're like i want to put one in my yard and i don't blame them but i had never understood why these weren't popular in the fall because you could plant them now and then in the spring you have your tree and then you have your blooms already in your yard so um i and it's it's a great plant to plant right now in the fall because it's woody and it'll be just fine. It'll hang out. It'll hang on during the winter. Um, so some ornamentals to consider. Uh, Mexican plum. That's what is in the picture there to the right. Um, this one is one of the first ones to kind of bloom, kind of along with the mountain laurel. Um, but we have groves of these here at the nursery, and it smells beautiful. Um, I. <laughs> I kind of find that if there, when there's thousands of them, it kind of smells like masa, which it turns from beautiful to like savory. Um, but it's nonetheless, it's a great pollinator plant. Bees love it. Um, Anacotra orchid, uh, which is endemic to the Anacotra Mountains, just one specific region, but it does great uh, in central Texas, pretty much all the way up towards Colorado Bend and down into San Antonio. Um, of course, your red buds. So you have your Texas, or your Mexican, depending on how much rainfall or what your soil is. And even Eastern Redbud does great too. Um, it's a good addition. Uh, Eve's necklace pretty much grows anywhere. I've seen it grow beautifully in Dallas all the way down to South Texas. So that's, um, and that one's really cool because the seed pods kind of, you know, harden and it's these, they look like earrings to me. I don't know why it's called necklace, but it kind of creates that year round interest. Um, Catalpas are really cool. They're a cross between the desert willow and the catalpa. I have heard if you have a really humid area, don't, I don't recommend planting it. it it's kind of um, prone to getting a, a fungal infection that I can't name right now, but it's detrimental to the tree. Um, your Texas mountain laurel, of course, uh, Mexican buckeye. Um, and if you're gonna plant this one, plant it in the shade. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people plant this as a specimen in their yard and then wonder why it drops its leaves in August <laughs> because it needs shade and a little protection. It doesn't like to be full sun. 
All right, so kind of sticking along with the woodiness of the plant, the woody perennials and the shrubs, again, this time of year uh, is the best time to plant this stuff. Uh, Flame acanthus, American beauty berry, uh, elbow bush. This one's really cool. This is another little first indicator of spring. Um, it's one of the first ones usually to bloom. And then it becomes this really inconspicuous little shrub plant um, that isn't much to look at, but it, it's still a really awesome addition to um, any native Texas garden, especially if you're going all native and you want to have that you know, natural look. Uh, coral tree, here at the nursery, we grow, we grow the Erythrina bidwillii. It's a cross, um, it is a sterile species, so it doesn't actually create the bean, but you wanna plant this. In Houston, you can make a tree out of this thing. In Austin, it's, it's really like a perennial. You gotta cut it back and it flushes out every year, but it blooms beautifully in spring and it's a great hummingbird uh, plant. Um, Silverbush germander, it's not native, but a great filler. Um, your sumacs, you have your evergreen and your aromatic sumac. Um, evergreen sumac is a little tricky, but this is the time of year to plant it. it. Its roots are super tender and fragile, so you want a fully rooted plant and you want to get it in the ground. You want to kind of establish it and then leave it alone. Too much water will kill it, so very careful with that one, but if you can get one established in your yard, it, they've, it'll definitely be rewarding. Um, Prairie flame leaf or shining sumac, depending on where you are in Texas, prairie flame leaf does really well, pretty much south of Waco. Uh, anywhere north of that, you have a very similar species is the Copalinum shining sumac. It kind of does the same thing, but it grows a lot better up in the Dallas area. Uh, Texas kidneywood is an awesome pollinator plant. Um, it can do well in shade, full sun. It, it, you can't kill it. <laughs> it's, it's a great, um, it can, it can be treed up or if you can keep it shrub size. And then coral berry. Um, this one kind of grows, it can grow prostrate, but it can also grow upright. So you can make it a ground cover or you can make it like a shrub filler, just whatever you really want to use it for. It, it kind of complies. So. And then, um, of course, as we all, I think we all know, seeding uh, wildflowers in the fall. Um, I'm kind of biased, but Native American seed uh, mixes are my favorite. They're retail and wholesale. So if you're just a homeowner, you can go on their website, order them online, or if you're wholesale, I believe they have wholesale pricing. Um, I know we get some of our Gallardia species from them, and uh, the owners are just wonderful people. And then something I kind of learned getting into the nursery industry is I had no idea, but you can plant plugs of blue bonnets, Gallardia, Forner, Monarda, any of those. You can plant them now or in the fall once it starts to cool down and they just kind of chill. And then you basically have insta plant that doesn't need to germinate in, um, in the spring. And the, I guess a good use for this is if you have a client or a customer that would has a small bed or area where they would expect to want wildflowers as soon as possible instead of just relying on germination. So if you have a more like cultivated or landscaped area, that would be a good use of um, wildflower plugs or four inch. They come in a lot of different sizes. And then your hardy succulents. So Texas requires hardy. Um, we have messed around for 30 years on what works here and, and what doesn't. And we've kind of narrowed down to uh, like a select five that are hardy down to like zero degrees. <laughs> you can't kill it, but um, plan accordingly. So we have found that if one day it's 90 degrees and then the next day it's 30 degrees, which is not unheard of here in Texas, um, we've lost hardy agave that we've just recently planted up. And so, you know, if you have, you know, any indication that you have a large, you have a, a major freeze coming up, don't plant the agave um, or the yucca or whatever. But so my recommendation is to plant this earlier on in the fall where you don't have you know, zero threat of that happening. If you're kind of dipping into November and 
early December, that's where you kind of run the risk of really stressing out the plant and possibly losing an expensive specimen, you know. So if you're gonna plant succulents, I September to late October is the time to do it. Plenty of time to get them in. But once they're established, they um, hang tight and they, they do all right, so. Um, and I know we wanted to save questions towards the end, um, but if I have any landscape professionals on here and you've never heard of Native Texas, um, my email is listed here, or you can ask um, Mung Mung, but, um, and I can go over availability or whatever. And I kind of glossed over quickly, you know, when Mung Mung told me to keep this to like 15 minutes, I was like, oh, that's no problem. And then I started making it and I'm like, oh my God, I could just go on and on about all these plants. So I know I went quick. So if you have any questions about anything, uh, there's my email. I'm very friendly, so I'm happy to, to help you out there. And then um, if you go on our website, uh, we have a neat little catalog that's really open to anyone. We have a, a wholesale area for our, exclusively for our wholesale customers, but the catalog is a really neat tool that you know, we've all worked really hard on here um, and used our personal knowledge and experience to kind of to make it. And one of my favorite places for pictures is wildflower.org. Um, information can be iffy sometimes because some of it's a little dated, but I do like their photo catalog for any of these plants I mentioned. So that's it. Well, thank you, Mandy. Uh, I really appreciate that, you know, your last one there, last uh, line there is, oh, of course, and of course, your Equilife Extension program is yeah. always there to help. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank, yeah, thank you for a little a plug in there. Uh, so, yeah, so in the, in the chat, uh, you know, in the chat box, uh, please uh, type in your, your questions. So uh, I'm going to take advantage of my... Uh, status as the host uh, today. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions first. So, so you mentioned about, uh, first, first of all, I really uh, appreciate your approach, you know, to have these things. You know, if you want to have these wow factors in the fall, hey, you know, these are some of the plants that you really need to uh, uh, plant in the springtime to help them establish and, and then, you know, and then to have to, to, for, to have a, a Mexican plum, you know, red bud, to have that, to get ready for the spring, to, the, to get ready for the wow in the springtime. Um, you know, these are the, the plants that you need to plant now. Um, okay, so uh, specifically the question I have is about the, you mentioned the, um, you mentioned the uh, um, blue bonnet. So for you said the blue bonnet plugs and stuff. So do you guys uh, sell? We do. Uh, we, plugs? Texas yeah. right well, now? We sell, we right. sell four inch and we're working. And so they've already germinated. And so Natalie, we kind of found too that we don't even have to put them in the heated houses. They just stay evergreen and happy and healthy in the freezing cold rain, sunshine, whatever. Um, there and then retail nurseries will buy them and advertise them as put them in the ground now and then come spring you'll be the first one with blue bonnets in your yard kind of thing and you won't have to rely on germination um, as much as an actual live plant already already germinated obviously um, so yeah I mean I, I never knew that you could do that and I've lived in Texas my whole life and I've gardened for over a decade and I always just was like, oh, if you put out your wildflowers, then you're, they establish themselves, obviously. They self-seed um, year after year. But um, I thought that was kind of cool. And again, it's really, that's really for a niche, like, market for people that, okay, I have this client that needs this specific bed that requires this plant. They want blue bonnets, you know. And so it is a possibility. But I don't think it's, I think it's, it's cool, but it's not 100% necessary. Seeding just does just fine too. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, Suzanne uh, mentioned that uh, uh, they have seen spotted lanternfly uh, feeding on poison ivy up there in Pennsylvania. Erfong, uh, Erfong or Carlos or Suzanne, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself, 
uh, what is the uh, what is the significance of uh, spotted lanternfly? Some of our audience may not be familiar with uh, spotted lanternfly, and and you know um, what are some of the uh, uh, the things that we uh, you know that that we should be expecting or will be expecting you know about spotted lanternfly feeding on poison ivy. Uh, Airfon here. So the spotted lanternfly is a, an exotic invasive pest. It's a sucking insect pest, um, similar to other leaf hoppers or plant hoppers, but uh, maybe more commonly thought of, um, or maybe people can think of aphids more, more frequently, uh, that they, they suck and produce honeydew and, uh, you know, reduce plant vigor and, and so on and so forth. Um, the spotted lanternfly they are uh, not at all choosy in terms of their food source. So they feed on a, a very large range of different uh, plant materials, um, especially in ornamentals and in nurseries. And they reproduce very quickly. Um, if you just, you know, Google spotted lantern fly uh, populations or on tree or something like that, you'll see that the tree just gets covered and they are quite large, uh, and so they can very quickly overwhelm uh, trees and plants, and as a result, can can be very detrimental uh, in the landscape or in a in a uh, grower facility. Now, the example that Suzanne provided is kind of beneficial, right? It's in, in a sense helping suppress some of the weeds, right? Uh, I don't know that that would justify trying to keep them around. Uh, but it's nice to know that they will feed on some of the, the plants that we consider undesirable as well. Now, I've been fortunate we have not seen any local populations in Texas, any local breeding in Texas yet. Uh, and we'll keep an eye open. It's, it's possible, you know, with these exotics, sometimes um, they don't spread or establish at the same level everywhere because the climate just might not be suitable to their life cycle. So we will have to just see over time if they start to move this way and if they do, uh, if they really become problematic or not. I, sorry, Thank you're you. muted, Mungo. Oh, yeah, yeah, Thank you, Erfa. Yeah. Uh, hey, yeah. uh, I, I, have, I have a question. Uh, it's called Stump the, uh, the Panelists. So, Laura, uh, Erfa, anyone. That won't be too uh, hard. I have a question for all of you, but also especially for, you know, and also for Mandy. What's the flower in my background? What is that flower? Is it Texas bluebells? Oh, uh, first you got the, uh, you know, you got the best non AgriLife Extension Presenter Award. Now you got the uh, best idea award, plan idea <laughs> award. I wish you could grow these. I, they were beautiful this year. I never really noticed them until this. I feel like every year a wildflower has its year. You know, like I, I think last year was Minarda. This year with Gallardia, I really think it's you know, you know, just temp or uh, what's the weather dependent on how the year goes. Uh, but bluebells, man, I sold bouquets. I'm a part of this Texas Flora Facebook group, and oh, it was just I was jealous. I was like, oh, I want some. So I, I, I hope we, we, we're really trying to grow new plants, and we're finding that a lot of people are starting to grow native. We're not as niche as we used to be. So we're like, oh, we got to one up them and let's grow some cool, cooler stuff than they're growing. And so we're, we've got some stuff in the works, but I really, this is one that I wish we would grow in flats. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask you uh, a follow up question. So I guess the answer is no. I was going to ask you whether you guys are considering, you know, offering like plugs of, uh, you know, picks of the bluebells uh, to your customers. I, I wish we've get we've again it, it's year dependent so I'm sure next spring we're gonna have people ask us hey you guys have Texas bluebells and we'll like and if enough people ask us and annoy our grower she's like fine I'll make a crop of them and shut up <laughs> and then I had one guy we did a snapdragon vine which is a cool one that grows around here and he just called he was like we're well, not growing it anymore I was like dude <laughs> it's not that easy but. We, we definitely try to kind of keep up with the trends and, and what is interesting and unique for sure. Yeah, Kelly uh, commented that uh, bluebells were gorgeous in Northwest Tarrant County this year. So Laura, you probably have, uh, you probably have also seen them too this year. So it was a really good year for them this year. 
Wow, so it's not only in North Texas. So the picture behind me, you know, that I use as my background is, is from the Hill Country, from uh, Llano County. And also I have some, uh, seen some pictures posted by my friends and they're in the, you know, in the Houston, uh, Houston area, Walker County. So yeah, this is definitely a good year for bluebells and, you know, not just in one particular area, but in, you know, all around Texas. And I think most of the work on bluebell breeding has been done for cut flower production, not so much for landscape use. So they're not, I mean, there's probably some potential there that hasn't really been tapped into. Yes. Uh, the, there are actually a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, bluebells, uh, you know, the, the breeding has been used in cut flowers and and if you uh, have heard of the name Lysianthus, uh, Lysianthus, and that's you know what they called that you know in in cufflaw world, and there are a lot of uh, different colors and doubles, triples, uh, all diff different kind of uh, horticulture cultivars out there. Mandy, we have another question for you. Uh, can you recommend any ornamentals? Uh, that will grow in bright light, mostly shaded area close to house. It will so, get direct part sun in the summer. So I was reading this, and to Marlene, if you're still with us, is it is it artificial light, bright light? Like it when it is getting sun, it's like wow light. Or I'm just a little confused from the question. If if it want if you want it close to the house, and um, anyway, yeah. Do you mind clarifying for me? Yeah, this this question oh, I is. I don't want to give you the wrong advice. Yeah, the question is slightly, uh, slightly confusing. So, Marlene, if you don't mind, just uh, you know, email me. Uh, just email me. I'm gonna. Well, I, I can recommend some. Just if I'm kind of getting the gist, um, like mostly shaded area. So, um, pigeonberry is a great one. It stays small um, and close to the house. I'm, I'm assuming that she wants it to stay small and not get too big. Uh, cedar sage, uh, you can do Katie's Dwarf Luelia. I mean, yeah, so if you want to email me, I'm happy to give you like this list of like way more than you probably wanted um, <laughs> plants that would do just fine in that area. All right, uh, do you have any, do we have any other uh, questions from the floor? Uh, I think we're, we're done answering all our questions. Our panelists, uh, Laura, Airfarm, Carlos, do you all have any questions for Amanda, maybe for Mandy? No, <clears throat> this is Carlos, but I have a comment. Uh, I do have a, a, a Vitex in my front yard, and it's a spot that uh, the irrigation water doesn't doesn't get very well, and it's in a bad spot as far as the soil compaction, and and it just loves it, and and I think he has enhanced the the grass around it, so. If you have one of those trouble spots, this may be something to consider. So Mandy, do you guys offer uh, uh, Vitex? Uh, we don't, but um, our neighbor, Austin Tree Farm, grows it. And I think it's a lovely tree. Laura had me kind of giggling <laughs> about what it's confused for because also on that Texas flora, Facebook group. I've had a lot of older ladies that have been very concerned about the plant that's growing at this person's house. And it's, it always makes, it's good for a laugh um, because it looks very similar. Um, but no, I know it's not native, but it's a wonderful tree. And I haven't seen it be invasive. Um, and I live in Caliche. So I haven't, I, I hike, I've pretty much been in every single part here in Austin and really in the hill country. Uh, and I've never seen it like I've seen Nandina or something like that. You know, it's, I don't just see it kind of popping up everywhere. Like, yeah, like Rogustrum or Nandina. So that's um, really good to hear. Cause it's definitely not invasive up here in North Texas, but you know, yeah, I, I, we don't have a problem with it. Maybe Houston, but you said it was, so it was uh, it's supposed to be central Texas. So I, you know, I don't know where this is exactly. I don't know. And I'm like, I'm, I have a buddy that we, he manages Balcones Canyon Preserve Land, um, and we go and I help him look, like document invasive a lot. And I never seen it. So, huh? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, you know, uh, all these things are written by people, and and sometimes, <laughs> and, and 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 we're not uh, always a hundred percent correct on certain issues. So, uh, so maybe that part of the, uh, maybe that part of the aspect, you know, about Vitex could be uh, rewritten. And of course, you know. Uh, we need more evidence and, and, and all that kind of thing. So um, so this is great. Well, um, I don't see any more questions. I think this conclude our uh, today's uh, chat with Green Aggies. And as always, um, thank you all for your interest. And, and, and special thank you goes to Mandy, Erfan, Laura, and Carlos, and all our panelists. Thank you all for your uh, participation today. Thank you. Have a, have a great you afternoon. Too. You too. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mengwen. Good to see you, Andy. <laughs>